Today, there are two million descendants of French Canadian immigrants living in New England. These are our stories. Welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Venez tous jeunes filles et garçons, je vais vous raconter l'histoire de notre immigration ici au USA. De grands aventuriers de pays étrangers. This is the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. I am Jesse Martin. Now, this week's guest is an important guest for the show. He was a guest recommended by a listener of the podcast who stressed how crucial it was that I speak. The guest is Frederick Lacroix, author of the book Pourquoi Le Roi Saint Un est un échec, or Why Bill 101 is a failure. Now, this book won the 2021 Political Book Prize presented by the National Assembly, which is obviously a huge, huge honor. Frederick, welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Now, before we get going too far, I'd just be curious, what is your background? Tell us where you're from and how you ended up becoming so invested in the discussion over language in Quebec. Uh, uh, so it's a long story. I was born in Quebec City, uh, but my parents traveled a bit. I'm a physicist by training, right? Interesting. So physics. Uh, so I'm, and I also work in that area. So I'm very, very far from uh, language issues. I was going to say, that's my, not language. Yeah. In my professional work, but there is a link, which is the following is that a physicist, a physicist's job is to build like a model of reality. So in his head, to construct a model that explains reality, whatever phenomena he's interested in. Sure. So for, for language, I have a long-standing interest in the dynamics of language, and uh, I applied those skills to building a model in my head of uh, how language dynamics work. So I, I've been doing this for a long time. Someone told me, well, you should write a book, and I never imagined writing a book in my life. I didn't think I could write a book. I wrote a book. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it seems so important to yeah. The, I have to say that the, the, the motivation, so I, I did engineering physics as a baccalaureate, so uh, B, B -Eng, I think it would be called, bachelor's. <clears throat> bachelor's degree, sure. Yeah, and then I, I did a master's and PhD at McGill University in Montreal, so an English language university. And I'm from Quebec City. I studied in French, Quebec City, French, right, is the dominant language by far. Sure. Uh, so I went to McGill, and at McGill, I met people who didn't speak a word of French and who grew up in Montreal. So to me, that was a shock. And that started me thinking, you know, why is it that, you know, I'm bilingual and they are not, and we are sure. both Quebecers, you know, we live here. So why, what is the explanation for that? You know, is it the, uh, it seems that my, my mother tongue has an inferior status in Quebec itself, because it's, for them, it's not deemed important to, to, to master it. So, I mean, that got me thinking, and that was 20 years ago, and I've been thinking about this subject ever since. So, so I, I've read all the, all the papers on, uh, you know, there's a, in Canada, there is a lot of research on this topic, obviously. Sure. Because of the Official Languages Act and the census data, there's a lot of language uh, questions in the census. Uh, so those questions are analyzed. People write up uh, uh, um, scientific monographs on that. And so there, there, there's a, it's less active now, but in the past, there was a very active research community on the topic of uh, language, you know, what's happening, which which way is the, you know, the vitality of each language uh, going. So that was for French and English, and also for indigenous languages. <clears throat> sure, sure, that makes sense. Now, I'm assuming it's going to come up quite a bit. Bill 101, obviously, it's in the title of your book. And yeah, quite a quite a few of the listeners of this podcast could be super aware of what that is, but I know for sure there's going to be some that maybe have heard of it and not entirely positive what it does or why it's or what it's supposed to do or why it exists. Can you just kind of give an overview? What is Bill 101? Why does it exist? What does it aim to accomplish? Yes, Bill 101 is the sort of the most important language leg legislation in Quebec. 
So obviously for, you know, Canada is a federation, so community of states, and there are two official languages. So there is legislation at the federal level that define French and English to be official languages in Canada. And at the provincial level, so at the, 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 the state, the Quebec level, there is also uh, language legislation, which is quite different from the federal legislation and which is openly in conflict with the federal legislation. So Bill 101 is the Quebec legislation and the Official Languages Act is the federal legislation. So one, the the federal legislation is based on the principe de personnalité, so uh, the individual's choice. So in theory, uh, when you're in Canada, you can choose English or French uh, for uh, interaction with the federal government. And in theory, you have the same quality of service in both official languages. It doesn't matter. That's theory. In practice, uh, service in French is uh, almost un, 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 not available outside Quebec. Every year, uh, there are there's a federal commissioner that follows complaints, etc. And every year for 50 years, it's been the same thing: is that you know services are not available and no effort is put into making them available. The Official Languages uh, Act of Canada predates Bill 101. It's 1969. So when Quebec saw that the federal go government was uh, going in that direction, that is uh, making you know decisions on language based on an individual's choice, which is fine in theory, but which completely, I, I don't know what the right word to use would be, but to with complete neglect the fact that both languages do not have the same status. Uh, French being a minority language and having the, the, the dynamic and the vitality of a minority language and English being obviously the dominant language in North America. So they don't have the same power at all, but the federal government pretends that they do. <clears throat> so when Quebec saw that the federal government was moving in that di direction, uh, they produced their own legislation, which is based more on a territorial principle. And those legislations are for Europe, for, for example, it's, it's the norm that uh, you, you will uh, have a territorial aspect to language legislation. For example, you're in that state, uh, the official language of that state is such and such, and that's it, right? There is no choice between uh, different languages. So it's based on the territory. So Bill 101 is based more on that idea. The idea being that if you uh, have this territorial principle, then you, you bolster the vitality or the strength of this minority language. Uh, so Bill, Bill 101 is, uh, was passed in 1977 uh, by the Parti Québécois. Camille Lorrain was the minister in charge. Uh, and interesting fact, tonight is the 44th anniversary of the adoption of the law. Oh, wow. so I don't know if you planned that. I did not, but uh, and now we have to uh, fare and fit down the apartment. Oui. So yeah. it's the 44th anniversary <laughs> tonight. It was adopted after a very uh, difficult debate. The opposition to, to this legislation was widespread. Uh, it was very a very tough debate. And when Camille Lorrain had uh, the, the, the law, when the bill passed, Camille Lorrain said that Le Québec est dorénavant et pour toujours français. That is, Quebec is now and forever French. So the, the pretension of the Quebec government was that with this bill, this bill was so fundamental that it would radically uh, alter the state of things in Quebec and make French uh, the de facto official language. And it would provide, um, you know, it would safeguard the future of French in Quebec. That was what they said, uh, because before that, so if we go bit back, go back a bit of the history of why the law was necessary. If you just go back after the second, the second World War, there was a lot of immigration to Canada and the, the states as well. I, I imagine. So there were a lot of immigrants uh, wanting to, to 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 come to Canada. So a lot of people. Um, came to Montreal from all sorts of countries. At the time, there was you could choose your language of instruction. 
So you could choose to send your kids to French school or English schools. There was no uh, constraint. So what happened, what, what, what was happening after the Second World War is all 95% of immigrants would send their children to English schools in Montreal. So the, 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 the figure is 95%. That's crazy. So people started calculating that if this is allowed to go on, then uh, obviously uh, the future will be bleak for French in Quebec. It took about 10 years for the government to wrap its head around the problem and admit that it had to do something. Uh, it, it first tried to do nothing, then tried another formula. That, so that Bill 63 says, no, no, everybody has the free choice to whatever language of instruction they want. And that did not go, go down well because people understood that that would mean eventually the end of French in Quebec. And then there was Bill 22 in 1974 where they said, oh, if uh, the, the child is already proficient in English, we'll give them an exam. If they're already proficient in English, then they can go to English schools and the rest will go to French schools. So that didn't work because there was a lot of cheating on the exams because obviously if you go to an English school, uh, in Canada, you're, you, you become part of the majority. So that's more interesting than to become part of a minority. If you're an immigrant and you go to Canada, you don't want to integrate the minority. That doesn't make sense. So finally, they had to take down the free choice of language introduction. And that was the major uh, axis of Bill 101. So they said, no, everybody that comes to Quebec as an immigrant has to go to a French school. So all the, the, the kids have to be registered to French schools. So that was a, a really fundamental change in, you know, all the approach uh, to, 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 to schooling and to, to, to all, the, all the approach around the language for uh, hundreds of years, not, that had never happened. So that's why Build 101 is such a, an important uh, marker, uh, so symbolically. Getting to the heart of it, then the stated purpose of Bill 101 is just is to ensure that French is here and safe forever going forward in Quebec. Why do you why do you think it's not working? Yeah, so the the the, the objective of the law, which is explicit, was that okay, we will integrate the immigrants that come to Quebec and they will become French speaking Quebecers in, in due time, right? Uh, school has uh, school is is used for that all over the world. So when the law passed and the government acted so forcefully, people believed it, right? People said, "Oh my God, those those language questions are never never so fun to deal with. No one, uh, you know, likes uh, language debates. It's very emotional. Sure, you know, it touches uh, the core of." Uh, <laughs> Many people, so they get heated and criminous. Uh, so the, I think people people thought that, oh, thank God, this is fast. Now we can just uh, get on with our lives and you know, do something else. And that was the feeling, I think, for uh, several decades after uh, Bill 101. So in 1977, up to I, I would I would say up to a few years ago, the majority opinion was that. Uh, things are going well, right? Uh, French is going well. Well, it could be better, right? You go to Montreal, sometimes you can't have service in French, uh, but it's not too bad, you know? You compare it to the past, uh, it's much better. So that was a general feeling. And I would say this, this feeling has started cracking in the last maybe two, three years. And people have started to realize that Oh, but maybe Bill 101 um, is not meeting its objectives finally. So the, in the past year, in, in the Quebec media, there have been a lot of reports on the, the on language issues in Montreal. So there's been a lot of media interest. And for example, there's been a reporter that went undercover in Montreal, just you know, collected stats on how, how many you know what percentage of businesses uh, cannot offer uh, service in French in Montreal. So they found that in the center of Montreal, the downtown Montreal was half the businesses. So that um, sent a shock. Sure. In my book, I, I sort of come out and say that uh, Bill 101 is a failure. 
It has not met obje its objective, its stated objective. So its main objective was to channel the vast majority of immigrants on toward the French side, right? So obviously, if you have a lot of immigration, you have to have and French and Quebec. Just for your listeners who maybe are not quite sure, French and Quebec is are historically it's eighty percent mother tongue uh, of the population is French. And uh, it's about 10% English mother tongue and 10% allophone, which is the term for non-English and non-French mother tongue. And obviously, since immigration is a, is a growing proportion of the population, what's happening is that there are, the percentage of allophones is growing constantly. Sure. So if you want to, uh, and, and historically the 80% Francophones of Quebec, it's been that it's been 80% for you know almost 150 years, so very stable. What we've, we've observed in the last 15 years is that the, that percentage, that 80% is going down slowly. So in the last 15 years, it's been creeping down. And it's two, in the 2016 census, it was 78% French mother tongue. So you might say, well, 2%, nothing to get excited about. But if you look at the long term historical data, it's never been below 80%, never sure. <laughs> in the history of Quebec. Sure. And 2% in, um, well, it's actually 3.4% drop in 15 years. So, in terms of demography, uh, that's a very steep drop because demography is something that uh, operates very slowly, right? Demographic changes happen slowly. So 3.4% is very, it's, it's quite a steep drop. And what we've observed also is that the English mother tongue is, is a stable, so it's not decreasing. If you look at the language spoken at home, so in the census, there are two main uh, uh, variables. It's mother tongue and language spoken at home. That's the Canadian census. So if you look at their language spoken at home, so there, there are more people that speak French at home than there are uh, French mother tongue speakers. So it means that uh, French is drawing some allophones, <laughs> but for the English population, there are much, much, there are many, many more people who speak English at home than there are people who have English as a mother tongue, which means that there are many, in terms of proportion, sure. Uh, there's a lot of allophones going to the English side, even now, after Bill 101. So it's about half and half. So if you look at it, English mother tongue in Quebec in 2016 was 8.1% of the population, only 8.1%. And they're drawing 50% of the allophone immigrants. So if you, can do, if you do the math uh, in such a regime, eventually they'll reach 50%, right? So the, 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 it's not an equal, it's not a fair distribution. It should be 90% towards the French side and 10% towards the English side, and you'd have a stable population. Sure. So we're, we're not there at all, when we're very, very far from it. So it's half-half, and it should be 90%, 10%. So I know that was the primary objective of Bill 101, was to say, okay, you have to have 90% immigrants go over to the French side and things will be stable. French will survive long term. Everything will be fine. The pretension was not even to say, okay, we want 100% of all the immigrants. No, we just want a stability. You know, we want the English community to survive sure. uh, because they've been part of Quebec for a long time. So the, we don't want, Bill 101's intent was never to eliminate English as uh, you would, uh, I, you, you sometimes read um, in the media. That was never the intent. The intent was to ensure uh, survival of the French and uh, have a um, sort of an equity so between linguistic groups. So you would have, if you have 90% on one side, 10% on the other side, then both groups survive. And both groups can uh, go on and, uh, you know, everybody's happy. That's the theory. But, but still 101, after, you know, more than 40 years, uh, is not there, and uh, I don't think it will ever go there. It will ever succeed. So that's the long answer to your short question. 
No, it's perfect. No, I'm, I'm curious. I honestly don't know the answer to this. Um, you mentioned how, you know, is it 80, less than 80% now have been as yeah, seven, 78. Do we have the numbers for how many, I guess, percentage wise, uh, what the trend is, I guess, is more important, are able to function in French? Like how many of those who may not have that as the mother tongue would, you know, be able to, you know, go do their daily activities speaking speaking French? And is that on the way up or down? Yes, that's a good question. The unfortunate thing is uh, there's a lot of debate around those questions, obviously. Some sure. people say that, oh, what matters is not home language or mother tongue is a uh, public language, right? What you speak in public, what you speak at home is not relevant. So there's, there's, there's people who say that. The first thing I have to say is that the census data is constrained mainly to the mother tongue and the home language. And there's some data on the work language also. Uh, but obviously, they're, they're already asking a lot of linguistic questions. <laughs> yeah. And uh, there, there was a commission to study this topic in Canada, a very important commission, which is called the Commission Laurent Duncan. So it was... It was launched in 1965, so in the 60s there was a language crisis in Canada. French uh, was uh, striving for independence, and the federal government got anxious and launched a commission to study the relations between uh, French and English. That's called Commission La Rando d'Antan, and that, that's the commission that uh, led to the official languages, the Federal Official Languages Act uh, law in 1969. And the commission studied the data and said, oh, uh, a very important variable is the home language. So the, the language spoken at home is a predictor of uh, the future vitality of the language because that's the language that's going to be uh, transmitted to, to the children. Sure. And it serves as a... Um, it's an indication of how things are going in the future. So that was their recommendation. So that the, there was a census question added in response to that. There, there's a lot of debate. We don't have you know, all, all the data that we would like to have, but I think that the, the home language, the mother tongue, so is an indication of the past. So the mother tongue population is looking into the past and the home language population is looking into the future. Because Excellent. you know that, you, you know what the trend will be uh, looking at that. So we have data for the home language. So mother tongue francophone is 78%. Home language is 80.6%. Okay. So we're above 80% on the home language. And there's a gain, right? There's a 2.6% sure. difference. The assimilation of the, of the francophone is not sufficient to drive that below the mother tongue. If there was a, a lot of assimilation, what would happen is that fewer people would speak French at home, then there would be French uh, mother tongue speakers, right? Sure. So you yeah. can picture that. Okay. Uh, so, so there, there's more, slightly more. So th that's not a bad sign. But uh, if you look at the trend on both variables, the trend is going down at about the same rate. So the home language uh, proportion of the population is going down uh, at about the same rate, at about 3% for 15 years. For people who wonder why, you know, uh, percentages are important, so that's a question I get sometimes. So, you know, you're looking at percentages, but, you know, what, what's important is the, the absolute number, the yeah. number of speakers. Uh, yes, it's true that, you know, the, the larger the population base that speaks a language, the more vitality that language has, obviously. In the, the field of language dynamics, so demolinguistics, I don't know if it's the correct term in English. So demography that incorporates a linguistic aspect. So you can model how languages evolve uh, demographically. Um, what they found it was the it was that it was the local uh, density of speakers that was important. So for a, a certain city, for example, it's the really the the the, 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 the percentage of speakers uh, that matter because. Uh, what matters in terms of language vitality is the number of interactions that uh, someone is subjected to. So if you live in a city where there are a lot of, of French speakers and you have to use French often, then eventually you'll 
you know, you'll use French more and you'll master it more and uh, you have a more of a tendency to speak it to your children, which will, you know, and if the percentage is small, then the frequency goes down. So you'll use another language more and eventually uh, the trend will be established. So uh, we've talked a bit about immigration. Obviously, he it's going to be a significant factor when it comes time to language. I really wish that this here we had the same rule as Ireland because then I would be able to get my citizenship. But as it is, I'm one, I'm one generation too far removed as it is right now, unfortunately. Uh, but there's a number of uh, students that are in the same language school I am who want to immigrate uh, to Quebec. And so they're learning the language. And so I'm curious if you can say kind of what resources are there for those who are immigrating to Quebec as far as helping them with French? And are these resources working? Are they having the, the intended uh, effect that we would like to think they do? So obviously the, the government has started to realize that there's a problem with the, the trend uh, facing French in Quebec. Bill one was it is a failure is not two years ago saying that was not quite acceptable. And now I think it's a, sort of a consensus that is gaining ground. So the government is aware that something must be done. It has tabled uh, an, another bill, language bill, to be debated this autumn, which is called the Projet de Loi 96, Bill 96. And it has taken steps. One of the steps is to make French courses available for free. For immigrants who come to Quebec. So that's that's new. That's a good thing, probably. If it will have an impact remains to be seen. I think one of the main problems that an immigrant, you know, to Quebec faces, say 90% of immigrants uh, settle in Montreal, in the Montreal area. So obviously wow. it's an international city. There's it's already the yeah, it's huge. They already have relatives there, living there, uh, most probably. They already have their community. They, they can settle there and not be uh, too far off base. And in Montreal, the, the percentage of uh, French speakers has gone below 50% in 2006. So I was speaking about the, the importance of the relative wage. And so in Montreal, the trend is very, very bad <laughs> because you have a 90% of the immigration is going there. So the sure. number of French speakers is getting diluted at a really fast pace, which means that uh, you need French less and less in Montreal. And the, so 75% so of the English community in Quebec lives in the Montreal area and 50% oh. on Montreal Island which means that uh, English has a very, has a large vitality in Montreal, which means that English as a work, as a work language in Montreal, I think it's fair to say that it's probably the dominant work language in, in Montreal now. So when an immigrant comes to Quebec, you know, if I, I put myself in the immigrant shoes, I come to Quebec, I settle in Montreal, and the government tells me, oh, you have to learn French, it's really important. But then I look for a job and they say, no, no, you have to speak English. You know, the, the, the economic aspect is probably much more who has to earn a living. And uh, so he's faced with a sort of a double discours. So there, there's two conflicting statements that he has to face. On one is the government that says, oh, French, learn French, learn French. And on the other, it says, oh, to, to work, you have to, to speak English. So the majority of immigrants work in English in, in, in Montreal. So, and that is a huge problem for the future of French, obviously. <laughs> so, so as an immigrant, uh, if you settle outside Montreal, sure. probably it's much easier to integrate and learn French. So even if you have free French courses available in Montreal, you might decide that they're useless. Or even if you do have them and you try as hard as you can, if you don't use it regularly, if you don't use it at your job, what's going to be the impact of yes, those courses? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, Bill 96 as something I saw all over the news during my time here in, in Quebec. What is that? What do you think of that? Will it help? 
seems to be a lot of opinion on both sides of that question. Well, I, I think that the positive, the main positive point of Bill 96 is that the government is taking things seriously. So it decided to table legislation to do something, which is something that has not happened since Bill 101 in 1977. So right and uh, after Bill 101, everyone said, oh my God, the language issue is, uh, is resolved. We're so glad, let's, you know, let's think about something else. So no government has done anything significant since that time. So it's everything has, has lain dormant uh, from 1977 to 2021. So the main positive point is that at last, at long last, uh, you know, there's going to be something done. Now, Bill 96 is over 200 articles. I said it's, it's a huge legislation. It's huge. Yep. Yes, which goes into every imaginable corner of uh, all sorts of uh, laws. I'm not a lawyer, so I, I don't analyze things from a, a lawyer's perspective. What I see is that it's really quite, quite complex, and it changes you know, a myriad of laws. You have to have a complete picture of what's going on. I, I'm not sure you know, who has that complete picture. I reserve my opinion on the complete extent of Bill 96. I'm not sh quite sure, sure. but uh, in my book, I've uh, talked a lot about the post-secondary education. Sure. So Bill 101 sort of took, sort of uh, removed the right to choose the language of instruction for primary school and secondary school, right? So, so from uh, five to 16 years of age. And after that, the free choice remains. So after 16 years, you go to CEGEP, which is a college. And after CEGEP, you go to university. Sure. And you have the choice of language of instruction for uh, both those levels, right? Uh, so Bill 101 did not touch that. So I've looked quite in depth at the dynamics of what's happening at the college and university level in Quebec. And what I found is that uh, the English CEGEPs are gaining, have been gaining ground for 25 years. And the same thing at uh, English universities. So in Quebec, there are three English language universities. There's uh, McGill University, which is huge and very, very rich. Uh, there's Concordia University also in Montreal, uh, uh, which is getting bigger. And there's Bishops in the Eastern townships, which is a small, more of a American style university. Uh, so there are three. What I found is that, so at the college and university levels, uh, they're, they're attracting more and more students, irrespective of the mother tongue. So they're attracting more and more francophones. We have data showing that there's a trend toward uh, working in, in English after uh, attending uh, an English language, CEGEP. Like in mm -hmm. Montreal, English is a very important work language. So people go to an English CEGEP and work in English afterwards. Uh, same, things for, same thing for university. So we have data showing that there, there, people are not attending language institutions only to, 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 to learn a language which they do not know, but in order to sort of switch linguistic sides. And the government, Quebec government is paying for that, right? So, and the, the trend is uh, steeper and steeper every year. So since there are two uh, language of instruction, when, what one language gains, the other loses, right? So the French uh, language, CEGEP and universities are losing ground. So they're losing students. And since the financing of the institution is on a, um, student population basis, uh, what's happening is that they're losing funds. So there's an attrition in terms of students, number of students, and also in terms of funding, which is very worrisome, right? For if you project the trends, uh, well, you can see that um, in Montreal, uh, English language universities uh, will dominate very soon. And uh, personally, I think that you, you know, you cannot have a French as a vital and powerful language uh, if that language does not exist or barely exists in the post-secondary education. So post-secondary education has become very important. When Bill 101 was tabled, 
few people went to university. <laughs> Francophones sure. did not attend university, almost. Francophones were very poor. Uh, they got jobs. They, they quit school and got jobs. Uh, they had to work. Their family did not have money. You, well, you see the picture. I do. Uh, yes, <laughs> so it was the same uh, south of the border, the same thing north of the border. Absolutely. So, uh, the Francophones were a, a, a poor population uh, with little education, and they had to work. So very few attended university. So I think universities and colleges were left out of Bill 101 because the impact of uh, putting them in the bill would have been so small at the time. Uh, education has gotten more and more important over time. And the college in Quebec is a free, so it's a free system, uh, almost. Uh, so you can attend CIGEP, so college uh, costs you almost nothing. And universities, the, 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 the fees that are owed on students are a small fraction of what you see in the state, right? So you can study sure. at a university uh, in Quebec, when you're a citizen, for a couple of thousand dollars per year, which is very uh, quite reasonable. So the, the attendance has been really increasing, and the importance of education. Obviously, to get a good job, you cannot work at, at a paper mill now. There are no more paper mills, so you have to learn programming uh, and whatnot. So um, what's happening at the college and university level is, I, in my view, is will determine uh, the fate of French in Quebec. Um, so the, the dynamics happening at the post-secondary education level will be uh, what deter will determine if French will survive long-term in Quebec or not. That I think that's as that simple as that in my mind. Does that answer the question? It does yeah, and I just want to make sure uh, for the listeners, especially back in, in the states, um, how I think so give me confusion because college and university that's the same level in the states. No, no, that's no. the same. College, that is not here. College is before you get to university. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, college is two or three years. Well, you you can do a technical degree in a college in Quebec, which is you become a technician as a three-year degree or you two years, uh, which is pre-university level. And that does not exist outside of Quebec. It's sort of a unique system. Uh, in Ontario, there's no such thing, right? People go straight from secondary school to from high school to university. In Quebec, you do two years before going to university. Uh, so college is before, university is after. So, yeah. yeah. I, I got you. Now, I'm I can hear listeners for sure, who are you know just kind of learning about this for the first time, saying, you know what, I I understand why the government of Quebec may not want to pay for English language schools and continue this trend, uh, but what about private education? Are there private institutions? Because obviously there are, in the states there definitely are where that does not accept any kind of federal funds, what's our government funds at all whatsoever. And anybody can you know pay to send their, their student, their child to this particular school. We have schools in all kinds of languages. I had one of student, student I was in school with here, it's taught in a Chinese inclusion school in the States yeah. that was completely private, that kind of thing. Is that even an option? Yeah, I have to make clear beforehand that Bill 96 that's being tabled does not touch the post-secondary level barely. So it does not restrict uh, the freedom of choice for language of instruction, which I think should be the case for the college level. The college level, in my view, should be, you should have to attend a French uh, college uh, if you want the government to pay for it, in my view. But Bill 101 never touched at the, the, the private sector. Uh, which, which is non-government financed, right? Bill 101 does not cover that. So if you come live in Quebec, you can send your children to an English school. There's no problem. The only thing is that you will pay out of pocket. All the language legislation regulates only public funded schools. So that's very important to know. So it, ne it, it never intruded on, from a, you know, a logical perspective, it never intruded on the freedom of choice of an individual to, to select the language of instruction of its children. It just said that, oh, you want to instruct your children in Cantonese, fine, but you just have to pay for it. 
sure. right? The government will not will not uh, pay for that. So there exist in Quebec uh, Greek language schools, Italian language schools uh, that are um, fully private in Montreal. Uh, there's also a uh, Christian school, etc. So, sure. but the dominant system is the public funded system. Otherwise, the cost of education is, is quite high, so you have to want to pay for it. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. And um, I guess the other thing that I've heard, you were just talking about this with, you know, uh, the Franco-Americans back home, um, is that, you know, it makes sense to me that students might want the opportunity to learn English at the CGIP level, because that would open perhaps more opportunities for them to go to universities outside of Quebec, either in other provinces or in the States, and to have the couple of years of English school preparation is a benefit to these students and gives them an advantage here yes, uh, that they otherwise wouldn't. Learning English is very, very important. You know, there's no one coming out and saying, oh, we, we don't want Francophones to learn English. Sure. That's, I've never heard that sort of discourse. So everyone is very, very conscious of the power of the English language in the world and North America, obviously. What has happened in the last 20 years is that the government has put in a lot more English in the French school system. Uh, before English uh, started at the fourth uh, grade in primary school, mm -hmm. and now they set it back to the first uh, grade. So when you start, you have English classes when you begin. Sure. Uh, they've also put in what they, 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 they term Anglais uh, Intensif, Intensive English in sixth grade, where people uh, do half the year in English only. Oh, wow. They have that. And in the secondary school system, there's many immersion, English immersion programs. So the census, what the census data says is that the, bio, the level of bilingualism in, of francophones in Quebec is skyrocketing. For the last 20, 15 years, it's been increasing uh, almost exponentially. Sure. Now, at the secondary, when uh, people finish secondary school, uh, the level of bilingualism, French-English bilingualism, is very, very high uh, for most students. Uh, we, this was not the case in the 1970s or 1960s. And you have to put that in perspective with uh, the rise of the internet. Oh, of course. Right? What we're doing now. Absolutely. Uh, so en English language platforms dominate the internet to uh, an astounding degree. So the young kids, you know, are exposed to English American culture or English language culture to a very high degree, you know, Absolutely. very young. So what we're seeing, in fact, is that is a trend where English is gaining ground among Francophones as a sort of uh, their preferred language. So it's not that they don't speak French, it's that they will, you know, prefer to consume American culture. Sure. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's not unique to Quebec. That this is happening, you know, all over the world sure. uh, because of the impact of uh, the, the, the the internet and uh, the, the 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 culture over uh, the internet. Uh, so when you combine that, you combine Netflix, English immersion programs in in the French schools. What you have is that you have a generation growing up which wants more and more to you know, switch over to the English side. Say, oh, uh, French does not offer me you know, opportunity. So what's happening is not that people do not speak English, is that they speak it more and more and to a level which uh, brings them to want to, you know, live their lives sure. in, in that language. What we're seeing is a cultural shift, I think, in Quebec. Whereas Quebec was always, you know, French and, and the, the French language and tradition, et cetera. So I think what we're saying is beginnings of a cultural shift where the young people are maybe not so interested in uh, you know, French language and culture as the previous generation. You have this shift, this cultural shift happening, which is, you know, which is slow, but in my opinion, it's the signs are very, very distinct. And then you have a government which finances 
courses at will uh, education in English. So you have uh, a push phenomenon from uh, the, 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 the fact that people are more and more competent in English and uh, the pull from uh, the lure of uh, you know, American culture, which sure. is very, uh, very sexy. So you have the, this, this happening and the government then finances uh, through the post-secondary system. If people want to exit sort of the, the French uh, majority, they can because the government will just pay their education. And uh, people, they, you know, they, they, they won't go study at an American university. I think the number of francophones, you know, studying abroad is quite small. Okay. Uh, so they'll just do it at the home language, the, the, the home English language universities and make their lives in English in Montreal. So I think the question that the government faces is, you know, should the government of Quebec, where French is the official language, uh, provide uh, unlimited funds for English language education? You know, I think that's, that's the question that, they, they, that the government faces. Sure. And if it was just a question of uh, having a population that was competent in English and could, you know, compete internationally at an economic level, right. that would be something. But I don't think this is this is not the discussion that uh, this is not what's happening uh, because the level of bilingualism is it's, it's, it's so high now that you have more people that speak English than people that wor that work in English in Quebec. So you have, the offer exceeds the demand for English right. speakers. Gotcha. Uh, so it's not a, an economic thing. So we're not limited economically. You know, we can uh, do business all over the world in English. Uh, we have everyone. We have all the competent people for that. It's more. A, it, it, it's more of a cultural thing now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so we talked quite a bit about um, education, obviously, which is a huge piece. Uh, and this has been super interesting, but a couple of things I did want to mention because I've been sent articles from listeners about a couple other issues, similar issues, which is being able to get government services in English and healthcare, the healthcare system in English. And I was just curious if you could touch on those because I know, again, listeners are paying attention to those two issues. Yes. So in my book, I, I go over those, those two topics and I show that you no, know, Bill 101 said that uh, French is the official language of Quebec. Okay, so what does that mean? Normally, when a state declares that its official language operates in that language, right? So yep. you have to conform to it. That's the most usual way of, you know, structuring language legislation. So uh, you go to Italy and the Italian government will not uh, provide you services in English. You know, Probably they might not. say hello, yep. but the, the, the paperwork won't be, won't be in English. Right. Right. Uh, but and I wouldn't Quebec, expect it to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fish, yeah, but in Quebec, officially, French is the official language, right? But in fact, the Quebec government is entirely bilingual. So it operates in English and French uh, throughout. You know, it's completely bilingual. And that was not at all the intent of Bill 101. What Bill 101 wanted to do is that it was to respect the historical English community. So it said, okay, will provide English services for the English speaking minority, which was around 10%. Sure. And for the rest, uh, it will be French services. But over time, offer of English language services, you know, was not restricted and it's complicated to restrict it. So now you can go to any office and get all the paperwork in English, talk to the person in English. If you're an immigrant to Quebec, not only will you be told that, oh, you have to speak English to work, right? But uh, what you'll see is that the government will speak English to you and will never impose French. So uh, you conclude quite speedily that French is of no use because that's even the Quebec the government the, does not impose it. Sure. Uh, so that's the state of things now. So Bill 96 that we talked about earlier uh, one of the main things it will try to do is to restrict the offer of English language services to the English community. And that's easier said than done, right, in my opinion, because what we see now is that the young people uh, you know, are very proficient in English. 
and they, they, they love to practice their English. So I don't know how the government will ever restrict, you know, the offer of English services uh, to, to the general population when uh, all the employees will be bilingual. Sure, everybody speaking so, English, yeah. You know, the French speakers, if you go down, go back in history, you know, the French speakers are a minority population in Canada, and that comes with a certain mindset, right, of dominé. You are part of something that's dominated. So in Quebec, this is very deeply ingrained that uh, you do not impose your language. So what you see all over Quebec is that if someone, well, maybe you've observed this yourself, that maybe you're at a, a business or wherever, government services, and I've seen this uh, quite a number of times, and someone comes up, and speaks in French to the person, but with mm -hmm. an accent, an accent. Mm -hmm. And the other person switches to English instantly over and over again, which yeah. is, you know, the deeply ingrained mentality that French, maybe you keep this for the kitchen among yourself. Uh, you'll speak it, you know, in your small group, but uh, you won't impose it. And if someone has an accent, so is not part of, comes from somewhere else, you won't impose French. So I think limiting the the offer of English services uh, is easier said than done. But I think it has to be it has to be tried <laughs> because sure. if even the government does not impose French, I mean the message is quite clear that French is useless, and that's the message that immigrants are receiving now is that French in Quebec is virtually useless because you don't even have to use it to uh, obtain government service, and that includes health services. So in Quebec, we have, like for the college and universities, we have two health systems, in fact, two public health systems. So we have an English public health system and a French public health system. So from a healthcare perspective, we have sort of a bilingual French system and more of a monolingual English system, which is also paid for by the government. If I resume things from the healthcare and education perspective, in my view, the Quebec government is the principal culprit for the decline of French in Quebec. So people often blame Ottawa, the federal government, and I think the federal government, yes, it acts so as to weaken uh, French in Quebec through the official languages law. Sure. But if you look at what the Quebec government does, acts, you know, it funds the decline of French. Uh, in an unlimited fashion. So the realization of the role of the, uh, the Quebec government in French decline in Quebec is sort of a taboo. You know, people don't want to hear that. People don't want to hear that, you know, maybe the main guilty party of the dire situation of French in Montreal is the Quebec government itself, which says mm -hmm. that French is the official language. There's a, a double discourse right uh there's two conflicting statements Gov the Quebec government says oh french is the official language is really really important but then it turns around and uh, uh and forces tens of thousands of employees to work in english in montreal no i got you it's just funny because i i ran into a very similar situation to exactly what you were describing even earlier this week when i was in subway that the, the restaurant subway I placed my order in French. The gentleman responded back to me in English. I responded back to him in French, and he came right back at me with more English. It was almost like a standoff between the two of us. It's pretty wild. It's, uh, I've seen that quite a, a few times, and it's, in my view, it's one of the most pernicious, and I don't know how to term that attitude, but it's, it's a complete catastrophe. You know, to do that is to sort of tell people that, oh, you don't need French, and if you have an accent, you'll never be part, you know, you'll never be included. You'll never, you know, be able to practice it sufficiently to master it. Sure. So the message, you know, the message angers me no. that that attitude incorporates. But you, what you have to see is that it's the attitude of the colonizé, right? The, that you, you have been dominated for so long that you've internalized the domination and you don't even realize what you're doing. So most of the people who, who do that don't even realize what they're doing. 
they're they're just you know switching to English as a is it it's an automation an automated process. They don't think they don't you know realize what it means. You would have thought that you know one thing that you have to say about Bill 101 is that so Camille Lorrain was a psychiatrist by training, and when he t tabled the bill, he said Bill 101 will be therapy. <laughs> It will be co collective therapy to uh, sort of dismantle uh, the domination which have been around for, for so long. So he thought that for the first time we will act as a ma majority and we will impose, you know, what we want, and this will have a therapeutic benefit for uh, Quebecers. But what we see now is that it, it's a failure. It, it has not worked. And the young people are uh, maybe worse than ever on that count. So they, 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 they will, you know, they, they will offer some service in English without thinking just because someone has an accent. And I've seen that. I've seen an American tourist in old Quebec order in French. You know, he was in old Quebec. It's beautiful. He's happy to, you know, say, Say a few words of French. Absolutely. And the person just brushes that aside, makes as if uh, he hadn't, you know, said anything, and just switches to English. And the person insisted and insisted, and it was, I was just listening to that, and it was like, wow. So I, I think that what the government would need to do is educate people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that uh, you, you know, it, it, it might be. Uh, simple courtesy not to switch to English, right? Sure. It might be uh, viewed as simple courtesy. So I, th I think uh, we should have an education campaign targeting that, saying that, uh, you know, uh, if someone comes out and speaks French, he's happy to speak French. He's in Quebec. He wants to, to speak French and, you know, pretend he's in Paris. <laughs> Uh, don't don't take away his dream, right? Well, for me it was funny because I I almost understand because it's happened you know a number of times, but um, I I get it. Maybe he responded back in English the first time, just assuming that would be easier for me. But when I respond again back, it's I'm, I'm trying to send a message like I I can understand you if you talk back to me in French. You don't yeah. have to switch. So it's almost like that standoff exists. So yeah. I think what you have to do is just explain things of course yeah 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 uh, just take it out of the non uh, spoken uh, area and just explain things yeah no I think and that's see right. his reaction and probably the reaction is that the person has never heard what you've said has never thought about it it's just pure automation and pure domination going back 200 years right uh, his grandfathers had to speak English to work and etc. And he's just completely internalized this. Yeah. And the therapy has failed. The Camille Lorrain yeah. therapy has completely failed. <laughs> Next time, I think that's a good approach. I'm going to take the time to explain that. You know, you might think you're doing me a favor, but it's completely fine to continue this conversation in French. It will be good. I think that'll be the approach for sure. Um, this has been way fun. This has been super, super interesting, though. I do have to ask one question slightly different time I guess it is kind of a different direction but coming from the perspective of this podcast I'm just kind of curious to get your your thoughts because I think a lot of at least the impression I have is that I think a lot of Quebecois and Franco-Americans almost have like a misperception of the other in that as far as the the battle to maintain the language I think both sides sometimes think that at least some I've come across both sides think that the battle is over. And for the Franco-Americans, a lot of Franco-Americans assume that the battle in Quebec is over and the Quebecois have won and that the language is safe forever, not an issue. And I think a lot of Quebecois just assume that the battle to maintain the language in the States is over and the, the Franco-Americans have lost and everybody just is just speaking English totally assimilated now. And I don't think either of them was right. Um, so, but I am curious um, if you think that the Quebec, the people of Quebec, government of Quebec, perhaps, or, or maybe organizations in Quebec can have a role in maintaining the communication with traditional Francophone places elsewhere in North America, like in New England or 
your Franco Ontarians or in the group down in Louisiana, the Cajuns. Yes, I'm far from being a specialist on this topic, uh, but I think we would greatly benefit from closer relations. Uh, in my mind, it's you know the the, the story of Franco Americans is fascinating, and. Uh, What's happening today is also very interesting. So you have a sort of a revival, a cultural revival. It, it's fascinating. Uh, I think um, the government should, the Quebec government should uh, pay close attention and develop uh, closer links. Uh, I've read the David Vermette's book, right? A Distinct Alien Race. Love David. So, uh, yes. It's an excellent book, which covers um topics which you know are not things that are not known so in quebec you you have the stories of you know my grandfather went to work uh in new england uh, and his uncles and uh, some came back some didn't come back so you have those kinds of stories so in my wife's family uh you have uh, quite a couple of uh, uncles went to the States and some stayed and one came back in the 1950s and he had a big car and uh, <laughs> the rich uncle in the States yes yeah yes and uh, he, he he had made it and uh, so you have sort of those, those, those stories floating around but you have a lot of ignorance uh, so we don't learn in school about you know all the extent of what happened so uh, the, the the extent the millions of you know Absolutely. Quebecois who, who went to the states. So this is not common knowledge. Sort of as if it was uh, censured, uh, forgotten. You know, um, I, I know for Quebec it was a trauma because it lost like a third of its population. Right. It was sort of catastrophic loss of population. So they just. I think put it aside and we don't want to think we don't want to speak about it no never happened <laughs> right no absolutely um, but I think this is unfortunate so I think things are not quite as they seem in Quebec or out of the border and I think we would profit from uh, you know knowing more I think we should uh, you know maybe have a sort of uh, the law of return or something. <laughs> if people want to come and settle in Quebec, there, there should be, you know, a special package. I mean, uh, uh, I mean other, other countries have done that. Uh, I don't see why we can do it, especially that Quebec has been increasing immigration uh, for the last, you know, 15 years. So, I mean, there's all sort of things that could be done. I, I don't know why it's not, more up on the agenda but sure. i think you know we have to exchange and get to know each other and uh yeah i would love that to be the case obviously like i said earlier if i was if my family was irish instead of french then i would i could you know move to ireland because i have a grandfather that was born saint apollinaire and that in and if you're Irish, if you have a grandparent that's born in Ireland, you can go back to Ireland anytime you want. Settle there, live there, work there. Unfortunately for Quebec, I'm one generation too far removed, which makes makes things a little frustrating for me because I would love to be able to come back, stay here. I'm, I'm having a blast here. I'd love to be able to stay. Well, you you could right as a as an immigrant, but you would have no, no special status. I think I think things like that were have been discussed. Uh, but it's never been taken seriously. Why? I'm not sure why. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time, Frederick. He's like the Frederick Lefort, an author of the book Pourquoi la loi sans un et un échec, or Why Bill 101 is a failure. So, where can people get your book before we let you go? In every library. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. no, but I have a I have a website, Frederick Lacroix. Uh, dot, uh, dot Quebec. So if you just Google Frédéric Lacroix, you'll find it. And on that, I have a link to uh, the uh, publishing house is Boreal, Edition Boreal in Montreal. And they have a list 
of, uh, well, libraries where it's available. And if you're in the States, I think it has to be shipped to you. So uh, there are links to buy it online, right? Awesome. Okay. I have no English version. That's so I, I would trade an English version <laughs> of this English version of that. I think that's completely fair. We can search, get your book translated to English. You get David's book translated to French. You can sell a whole lot of copies on both sides of the board. Thank you very much for your time, Frederick. This has been a super, super interesting conversation. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Now our fathers look at us and sigh with despair To think that everything they love we simply do not share But the spirit never dies, our culture will survive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Special thanks to Josie Vashon for providing the music. You can find more about her at josievashon.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Mike Campbell. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at fclpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at fclpodcast for more information about the topics discussed. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this episode.